welcome to today's webinar. I'm Beth Probert. I am an MPM patient, was diagnosed a few years ago with polycythemia vera, and I was so fortunate to find patient power and really learn more about how I could be an advocate and have better results with my disease. Today's webinar is where are we headed with the treatment of acute myeloid leukemia? What can patients look forward to to the coming year? This is a Patient Empowerment Network program produced by Patient Power. And I'd like to thank our sponsors. As always, our sponsors have no editorial control over the content. Today we're going to talk about topics like recent breakthroughs in AML treatment and research announced at the 2018 American Society of Hematology ASH annual meeting. We'll look at emerging clinical trials and how to access them, individualized approaches to treat distinct AML subtypes, and how will these advances translate for patients. You'll also hear from AML patient Steve as he shares his firsthand experience facing AML and how he's doing now. We will also answer viewer questions. And if you have a question, and please keep in mind, we can't get real specific with these questions, so try to keep them general, really geared more towards information and questions. And we'd like you to send those, your questions throughout the program to questions at patientpower.info. I'm going to repeat that one more time, questions at patientpower.info. We will try to answer all questions that come through, and if we can't get to all of them, we will certainly address them through future webinars. Now, um, I'd love to introduce you to today's guest. Our first guest is Dr. Novel Dover, Associate Professor Department of Leukemia at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Welcome, Dr. Dover. I'm so glad you can join us today. Hello, thank you for having me. Glad to join. And our next guest is Leah Zumida. And Leah provides uh, clinical trial support at the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. So Leah, thank you. I'm glad you can be here today. Thank you, I'm so happy to be here. And our next guest is our patient panelist, uh, Steve Beekler, and he is an AML patient who's had a remarkable journey. Steve, welcome from Minnesota. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Great. Well, Steve, you know, we'd like to get started with you. Um, I'd like for you to tell our viewers um, a little bit about your life with AML, and if you can include how did you get diagnosed? You know, what was that like getting diagnosed? And um, how did you react? Who is your support team? And, and just what you've been through. So I'll turn it over to you now. Well, um, at age 64, I was living what I thought was a normal, healthy life. Um, I had no symptoms. My primary care physician had been monitoring my white blood cell count for a couple of years because it was borderline low, uh, but not too alarming. And then in the spring of 2016, it began to drop more precipitously. So he recommended I see a hematologist, and I went to do that. And the hematologist said I should probably have a bone marrow biopsy. And so I agreed to do that, you know, sort of to humor them because I didn't feel sick. I didn't have any symptoms. I didn't have any idea anything was wrong. Um, it was a memorable week. The biopsy was on a Monday. On Tuesday, I swam my normal 50 laps. I uh, did some shopping. I ate dinner out. Wednesday morning, I played in a weekly poker game with some retired guys. So life was normal until that phone call that came Wednesday afternoon, informing me I had acute myeloid leukemia and I had to get to a hospital right away. So the next day I checked into a hospital. Uh, the day after that, Friday, I started chemotherapy. So in 48 hours, I went from feeling perfectly healthy to a 24-7 chemotherapy drip. And they started me on the standard treatment uh, that's been used, I think, for a very long time called 7 plus 3 cytarabine and idorubicin to try and get the cancer into, uh, into remission. And so I spent a week on that, uh, that medication, those medications, uh, and then awaited for the inevitable drop in my white blood cell count and my immune system. I was going to be very vulnerable to various kinds of infections. And, you know, as predicted, I came down with colitis and an E. coli infection, oh. body rash, and a bunch of other stuff they couldn't even identify. Uh, but the infectious disease doctors kind of stepped in and uh, dealt with those issues one at a time. So I ended up spending five and a half weeks in the hospital for my counts to recover. 
Um, but the good news was one month after starting chemo, they did a bone marrow biopsy that found there was no residual leukemia. So the first goal had been, had been reached at that point. I was, I was in remission. Um, yeah. Adding to the story, of course, the first night I spent in the hospital, my wife was with me and uh, left late in the evening to go home. And, and as she arrived home, she had a stabbing pain in her, in her, left, in her right leg. The next morning, got up and could hardly get out of bed, called uh, 911. and brought her to my hospital in an ambulance through the ER, and it turned out she had a fractured femur. So I was on one floor of the hospital in the chemo ward, and she was on another floor of the hospital awaiting a subsequent surgery to repair her leg. And, um, and then she went off to a, a transitional care unit uh, for rehab. So um, when I realized our house was going to be unoccupied for about a month, I started to write to our neighbors on email. And I found that was a really useful way to communicate. So I ended up over the many months that followed uh, adding maybe 60 people to that email list and sending over 60 emails out over the course of a year and a half uh, to keep people, uh, keep people informed of what was going on. I subsequently realized as I was writing for other people that I was really using that writing to um, make sense of my own experience. Uh, I struggled to figure out what was going on and how I could capture it and how I could explain it to people. And uh, it was useful to get their responses back, but it was useful for me. It was very therapeutic for me just to have that writing experience to make sense out of what was going on. Um, after five and a half weeks, I got, uh, I, I got permission to leave. I went home for a while, uh, but I was awaiting the genetic testing of my cancer to figure out what the next round of treatment would be. Because I think people know with AML, um, there needs to be a second round of treatment. It can come back very fast and very ferociously. I was told that the, gene the genetic testing of my cancer would put me in either a low risk or a high risk category for recurrence. And that would point toward either chemotherapy if it was low risk and stem cell transplant if it was high risk. When the results finally came in, they said, well, you're kind of in an intermediate category. So the way forward was not as clear as I thought it might be. So I talked to my initial oncologist. Um, I did my own research. Uh, I subsequently went and talked to a transplant oncologist at the University of Minnesota Medical Center um, who, who sort of nudged me toward the transplant option. Uh, I went to the Mayo Clinic and got a second opinion. And all of the indications really were that I would be a good candidate for transplant. I had no comorbidity. I had no other health problems. And everybody thought I should probably be able to withstand the conditioning uh, uh, fairly well. So eventually I came around to that decision to have a stem cell transplant. I had a brother who was a half match donor, but uh, the folks at the BMT unit said, we also have some good uh, umbilical cord blood matches for you. And so I was again faced with a decision about which way to go. Um, but it turned out they had a study. Don't they always have a study? Um, <laughs> and I was randomly assigned to the cord blood donor option. So my brother was off the hook and I ended up having a double cord stem cell transplant in October of 2016, about four or five months after I was initially uh, diagnosed. Um, that uh, procedure went very smoothly, and within three weeks, a biopsy revealed that one of my cord donors was 99% engrafted, which is pretty early for a cord blood uh, procedure. Um, so that was good news. I was able to go home at that point and begin a pretty long, extensive, and sometimes arduous process of, of recovery. Uh, the first 100 days, they often have you come back to clinic uh, daily for the first month or so to get uh, blood tests, get platelets, get red blood cell transfusions, whatever it is that you need uh, to keep you healthy. Um, it's a pretty vulnerable time. One of the oncologists at the transplant unit described this whole procedure as, you know, first we bring you to the brink of death by killing off your diseased immune system, then we try and bring you back again. Um, well, it worked in my case, I'm happy to report. So by early 2017, I was beginning to taper off my anti-rejection medication. Um, that ended in April of that year. Uh, and then it was just a process of gradually getting, getting more strength, getting better. And in my case, very fortunately, I avoided uh, any trace of graft versus host disease. Um, so that allowed me to have a pretty healthy, uh, healthy recovery. One year after my transplant, of course, I had to go in and get my baby shots, my vaccinations and immunizations because my previous immune system had been obliterated. And they only gave me the, the dead vaccines at that point because they reasoned I couldn't uh, handle the, the live ones. So that happened at year two. Um, and that was recently completed about uh, two months ago. I uh, got the rest of my vaccines. Uh, the other good part of the story is, although there was a 60 to 70% chance of graft versus host disease, um, I, I never had any trace of that. Uh, I've since become very active in talking with other patients as a volunteer, uh, doing some writing, becoming involved in the cancer community. And I've come to appreciate really how 
how fortunate my story was. I think the three big indicators were I got into remission on the first try. I've talked to a lot of patients who didn't, haven't been able to do that. Uh, my, my transplant engrafted within three weeks, uh, which was a very solid early result, and a lot of patients don't have that kind of success. And I had no grafters as host disease. So um, that's about as good a story as you can have with AML, as I understand it. So obviously, I'm very, very grateful to have done that. And, uh, and something like that gives me a lot of motivation to try and give something back. So I've been participating in various ways uh, in the cancer community. So uh, believe it or not, that's the short version. Steve, you have a remarkable story. I, I just, you know, I, I heard we talked earlier and just to keep hearing your story again is, is really just so noteworthy. And um, in the three points you made, you know, just having that um, early remission, you know, the first time with chemo is, um, is amazing and early um, engraftment just within three weeks and uh, no graft versus host disease and your enthusiasm and wanting to give back and um, just with your writing and um, I, I will talk a little bit later. I know that you have a book that's coming out. So your story is it's for someone like me amazing, but Dr. Dauber, um, I'd like to turn to you for a few moments and tell me is you know, Steve's story typical and you know, what kind of feedback do you have on his journey? <laughs> So, I mean, Steve's story is, uh, is, a, is a very good uh, outcome story. Uh, it's not necessarily typical, um, as, as Steve mentioned. Um, you know, about 70 to 80% of our patients will go into remission with the first induction. So it's, it's a high number, but it's, it's not 100%. Uh, and if you don't go into remission with the first induction, that is actually one of the very high risk or adverse features. It's called primary refractory ML. And uh, those patients usually do have a much harder time. Uh, the second thing is about 60% of patients will fall in what we call intermediate groups. So we do do molecular and cytogenetics. And uh, if we find that we have favorable molecular cytogenetic changes, then those are considered to be good and we may not do transplant. On the other hand, if we have unfavorable cytogenetic molecular, then it's very clear that transplant probably is the only hope for long-term survival. But unfortunately, a lot of patients fall into intermediate group. Now that intermediate group is uh, becoming smaller and smaller because we are understanding more and more about the molecular machinery, the cytogenetics, uh, and the prognostic impact of new molecular mutations. So we are able to triage patients better into high risk or low risk, which helps us make the transplant decision. But I think the most fortunate thing uh, in Steve's case was the lack of GVHD. Uh, that mm -hmm. is very uncommon. Uh, most of the patients we see will have some degree of GVHD. It may be acute, it may be chronic. Uh, in most cases, I will say that it is manageable. We rarely see very severe ICU requiring GVHD or fatalities from GVHD, but okay. about 60 to 70 percent will have uh, some degree of GVHD will require some treatment for it with steroids or additional immunosuppression. And in some cases, it can take many months and can be a major uh, discomfort and affect quality of life. So I think that was fantastic that uh, he did not have the GVHD. Uh, and I think all those features, although, you know, are seen in a traditional AML story, I think uh, Steve was fortunate and uh, the outcome was very favorable so far. Great. I really like that feedback. And, and what I wanted to ask you as well, in regards to the no graft versus host disease, you said uh, about 60, 70% will actually encounter that. So am I correct in assuming then that um, when you do uh, a transplant with someone, you account that that's probably going to happen, the uh, graft versus host disease, and you have treatments and things lined up in anticipation of that happening? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when we do the stem cell transplant itself, we actually uh, do prophylaxis for graft versus host disease. So almost all patients will be on steroids, uh, some form of immune prophylaxis. It may be tacrolimus. Uh, it may be serolimus. There are some newer drugs. And in spite of that, if we see graft versus host disease, we have uh, some very good medications. In fact, some recent drugs approved, such as ruxolotinib, ibrutinib, et cetera, which can work. But in spite of all that, I would say a majority of patients do face uh, a struggle with graft versus host disease, and they do have some degree. Now, again, it may not be severe. It may mm -hmm. be 
form of uh, graft versus host disease of the mouth, which causes your ability to eat, you know, to be decreased, or maybe the skin, which could be itchy or uh, uncomfortable, or it could be ocular, which causes eye irritation and burning by eye drops. So they may not be severe, but they usually do cause discomfort affect quality of life. Uh, but yes, we do try our best to avoid it. And in some patients, we are able to get away with none. But And in some patients, they will have mild to moderate, which has to be treated. Luckily, with the newer generation of immune prophylaxis monitoring treatment, we have very few severe graft versus host disease, which is a good thing. Great. I'm so glad you touched on that. So I wanted to shift gears a little bit, Dr. Dover, um, and find out from you, what are some of the key takeaways for AML patients and care partners from ASH. And I also wanted to say what I've heard a lot in regards to AML is that for almost 40 years, you know, there was, you know, just a standard way of treating. And all of a sudden in the very recent uh, years or maybe year, I'm hearing that there's so much now, you know, new drugs and things happening. So would you mind uh, touching upon some of those key takeaways? Absolutely. I think, um, you know, this year uh, at ASH 2018 was clearly the year of AML. There's just compared to all the other heme malignancies in the last two years, there's just been a huge amount of uh, progress in the way of approvals. Now, what I do have to say is, although we are seeing the fruits of a lot of efforts, uh, actually the research in AML has been very intensive for the last 15 to 20 years. And what we're now seeing is really the culmination of a lot of those efforts, molecular immune analysis, which have led to these drug approvals. But today, really, I think compared to even three years ago, when we did not have a number of these drugs, the whole outlook for treatment of AML has changed dramatically. So we've had eight new drugs approved wow. in the few years. And to put it in perspective, for the 40 years before that, we actually really had almost no drug approved. There was one drug, Jim Tuzumab, approved, but it was actually withdrawn from the market. So when they say, you know, when it rains, it pours, that kind of uh, really did happen in the case of acute myeloid leukemia. Mm -hmm. But what's really important, I think, is that there are now a number of targeted therapies uh, towards particular mutations. And some of these have actually been approved in the frontline setting. So now it has become very important that we don't just treat all AMLs as one disease. And in fact, that's something we knew for about 20 years, that AML is one of the most heterogeneous of all malignancies, lung cancer and AML. These are probably the two most heterogeneous cancers where it's not really this is AML. It's different types of AML, which could have prognosis of 95% cure rate all the way down to 10 to 15%. So identifying these groups was very important for prognosis, and that's something we've been doing, but more important for treatment. So for example, a mutation that is called a FLT3 mutation, FLT3 mutation, is very, very important because on its own is associated with an adverse prognosis. These patients had high white count, proliferative disease, and their three-year or five-year survival was usually 20 to 25 percent when we first identified this mutation in 2001. Now there are new drugs called FLT3 inhibitors that specifically inhibit the FLT3 mutation pathway. And with the addition of FLT3 inhibitors, specifically a drug called Midostorin that was FDA approved one and a half years ago, plus stem cell transplant, and even more so at the recent ASH 2018 meeting doing post stem cell transplant FLT3 inhibitor, when we do all these three interventions, we're now getting up to five-year plus survival rates of 75%. So this is amazing. A patient who was 25% uh, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, when we first identified this mutation, could today, if appropriately treated with FLT3 inhibitor transplant and FLT3 inhibitor maintenance, could be in a 75% uh, long-term survival rate, so tripling those outcomes. And similar things are being seen for other groups. For example, APL, acute promyelocytic leukemia, is one disease where we actually are able to treat these patients without chemotherapy. So you can give a combination of atra arsenic, which gives you 95% cure rates. Uh, so the key now, and what I tell a lot of our community doctors, our fellows, other academicians, is it's not about just rushing into treatment, which has been the paradigm for 30, 40 years, but more important to identify specific molecular mutations or cytogenetic changes and choose the best treatment because the impact of choosing the appropriate molecular or uh, non-chemotherapy or antibody-based treatment is actually much more than quick therapy. And I think that message now is going out um, and, and things are improving overall. Wow, and, and what I'm hearing are two things, you know, eight new drugs, However, those eight drugs are specifically going to be used in regards to 
different mutations. And so my question to you is, uh, it's very obvious that genetic uh, testing for these mutations is a huge puzzle piece to this. And could you talk a little bit about that? You know, at what point can a patient get uh, this genetic testing for the mutations? And um, if you could just speak to that, because it just sounds that is essential. Yeah, absolutely. I think that is probably the number one takeaway for, for both patients, caregivers, and physicians. Uh, so the genetic testing should be done for all new AMLs at the time of diagnosis. And, mm -hmm. and there's a number of different labs across the country, commercial labs that are able to do this. Uh, neogenomics, foundations, hematologics, you know, all of these are mm -hmm. now insurance approved and covered. Uh, some of the larger academic centers have their own molecular testing analysis. Uh, the most important thing is that we should usually wait for these results before uh, rushing mm -hmm. into therapy. And just to give an example, when we see a new AML at MD Anderson, we will rush their cytogenetics and molecular testing. We're looking for cytogenetics to rule in or rule out APL, acute promyelocytic leukemia, because this can be treated without chemotherapy with 95% cure rates. The other big group we're looking at is what we call core binding factor leukemia. These are a group of specific chromosome associated leukemias. And if you find those, then that is the group where the addition of an antibody treatment called gemtuzumab, ozogomycin, or myelotarg, which is FDA approved, can improve the survival rates by almost 20%, which is a huge wow. amount on top of chemo. So you don't want to miss identifying this core binding factor chromosomes. Then if we don't find one of these two, then we rush our molecular panel. Uh, we are fortunate we get the molecular results in 48 hours. That's one of the quickest in the country. There's a few other groups that are in the same range. But even in the commercial setting, I know for a fact that they're able to get these results in six to seven days. So I think it is actually possible and feasible. And even on some of the large trials we've done across 100 plus centers, we were able to safely wait for those results. The two molecular results were most important looking for are FLT3. If you find that mutation, we want to add the FLT3 inhibitor up front and then IDH1, IDH2 mutation. And if you find those, we may consider on a trial basis adding IDH1, IDH2 mutations. And then if none of those mutations or chromosome groups are identified, then we would consider standard treatment. But even there, we have trials where we're adding new drugs, which have shown very high activity, like venetoclax or nivolumab or immune therapies to standard chemo. So really, this is now personalized therapy. There's five clear subsets of AML that will have different treatment approaches and addition of the appropriate agent could improve your survival and cure rates from anywhere from 10 to 30 or 40 percent. So I think this is quite, um, quite important. And driven. It's, it's just amazing. And what I'm also picking up on and what I've been told about AML is that you need to move quick. This, this is uh, once diagnosed, uh, time is of the essence, and especially with the different subtypes. So we're talking about genetic testing, and I um, really, really was very interested in hearing um, how it works and uh, how quick it could be turned around. But um, what would you say, uh, we very often hear, and like in Steve's case, uh, it was his uh, doctor who referred him to a local hematologist and then eventually to a specialist. Sometimes we hear people you know, being rushed to the hospital or going to their local doctor, but time is of the essence in getting these, uh, this genetic testing. What advice do you give patients who uh, typically might go to a local doctor, um, you know, how to move along in this process and how to advocate for that genetic testing? Do you have any feedback on that? Yeah, I think, I think there's a fine balance. And then that's where it's, you know, hard to make a generalized uh, recommendation across the board because there are some AML patients that come to us who have a very high wind count, more than 100,000, for example, or they may have evidence of leukemia already infiltrating their liver or kidney with uh, organ um, uh, abnormalities and lab changes. Uh, and in those patients, we may have to start treatment very early. But those, those are the minority. I mean, we've published this, other groups have looked at this, those make up about five to 10%. So in the majority, uh, it is actually a mindset change. And this is something we're doing a lot of education on as well, is that that mindset of the sun should never set on AML, we have to treat right away, actually was true when you didn't have other effective therapies that could be added that could change your outcome from 25% to 75%. But today, in fact, I think it's much more important to select the appropriate treatment or the addition of the appropriate molecular immune therapy 
than rushing into treatment. And in fact, mm-hmm. uh, our group, as well as a number of other groups in the country, have published it. So what we recommend in general is if we get a new AML, uh, we would admit those patients. I still think that this is an inpatient disease. We would monitor them closely. We send on the same day that we see them a molecular chromosome panel. We ask it to be rushed. And then usually we can get these results in three to five days. Uh, And I would wait to get those results because based on those results, we may choose a FLT3 inhibitor. We may choose the antibody gemtuzumab. uh, We may choose IDH therapy. We may choose atra arsenic. So I think for most patients, what you could do, of course, you have to be, you know, uh, careful when you're discussing with the physician. You don't want to, you know, push on them too much. But I think it's important to ask about, you know, molecular therapies, molecular trials, uh, whether we could get the molecular information early and how we could incorporate that. Um, I think the good thing is we're seeing that across the country, most of the physicians are uptaking this uh, approach and there is very intense education. Uh, but I still think it doesn't hurt to ask about it uh, and make sure that that testing is being done because I think it could make a huge <laughs> difference in your outcome. Great. Wonderful feedback. Now, Leah Zumida, I'd like to bring you in on this conversation because um, you know, we're he- we heard eight, eight new uh, medicines right now. That's huge. And as Dr. Uh, Dahmer said, you know, those are the results of clinical trials. And um, recently I heard that only about 5 to 8% of adult cancer patients are um, participating nationwide in the United States in clinical trials. I mean, that seems like such a small number. And we depend on these uh, patients uh, to participate in these clinical trials to come out with these, you know, eight new meds. I mean, this is, you know, there, there's definitely a gap. And um, I'd like to hear your feedback about just that. And then if you can go into, um, you know, well, I'm going to ask you a few more questions about how people get involved in clinical trials. So <clears throat> could you take, take us through that? I, great, I will. So I, I have to echo Dr. Dover's sentiments um, about the importance of the genomic testing as well. And, and really, this new breakthrough in AML therapy is just a testament to the ongoing research. He said, as he said, the research has been happening for 15, 20 years, and we're finally seeing the fruits of the labor. So it's encouraging. Um, and that 5 to 8% is low, but there's room for improvement. And I think many different organizations have uh, in, um, identified barriers to why these enrollment uh, rates are so low. Um, I will say that, you know, of all the clinical trials, somewhere between 2 and 10% of clinical trials have to close because of low accrual rates. So there is just serious work to be done. I think you could look at barriers in two different ways. There's patient barriers. Um, there's just a lack of awareness um, that, that clinical trials exist for all stages of diseases. So many people believe that um, a clinical tri- trial is only um, for those who have exhausted all other treatment options. And so that's actually not true. There's trials for every stage of disease, um, pre- you know, previously untreated, newly diagnosed, relapsed refractory, maintenance and remission. Um, you know, there are other barriers um, that people are afraid to be a guinea pig. And so I think as healthcare providers, That's our job to really educate that, you know, uh, clinical trials are very controlled, closely monitored situations, provide education on the different phases and what those mean. Um, There are, you know, very complex and stringent inclusion exclusion criteria to clinical trials, which for in one way can make it very difficult to understand if you're even eligible for a trial. And so that's why uh, clinical trial nurse navigators such as myself can really help patients and caregivers sort through that information. Um, And then, you know, sometimes physicians aren't aware of all the trials that are out there either. And that is not not to slight practitioners, but again, it's just an overwhelming amount of information. It takes time to stay on top of all this research. Um, It takes time to go through all this research and all the different protocols. And so, you know, it's really important for patients and caregivers to have an advocate to try to identify what clinical trial is right for them. And so um, through the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, you offer this service. And uh, if I understand you correctly, so patients and their caregivers can reach out uh, to your department and find out, you know, what is there for me. 
Um, what comes to mind also, I hear quite often, and I'll get Dr. Dauber's opinion on this as well in just a moment, but there seems to be roadblocks to people. Not only, I don't want to be a guinea pig and understanding that piece of it, but also are there some financial hurdles, um, geographic hurdles? I, I hear from patients mm -hmm. quite often that I live so remotely, I'm in a rural area, how would I manage this? So could you give a little feedback about that? Sure. Um, first, with regards to the financial barriers, um, another common myth is that a clinical trial is free. And unfortunately, it's not. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that oftentimes, whatever's being studied, either a, a new drug or a combination of drugs, um, that usually is covered by the sponsor of the trial. But the rest of the care um, needs to be billed to insurance. And then there's this third bucket of cost, which is the money it takes to get someone and their family members to and from all these appointments, um, prolonged hospital stays away from home. So those are significant financial barriers to participating in a clinical trial. Um, there are resources out there to help navigate through some of these obstacles. And again, I would encourage people to contact Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. We can help um, steer you to those resources. Um, with regards to the geographic barrier, um, it's correct. You know, a lot of these large academic medical centers um, are not in proximity to people in rural areas. And that is one um, key point of clinical trials that needs to be improved upon. And, you know, I think a great goal would be to get some of these later stage, later phase trials out into the community setting um, where they may not require quite as intensive monitoring, but it can also be available to more patients and really diversify the patient population. Great, really great feedback. And then Dr. Dover, um, I know that um, your center is very proactive with communicating clinical trials uh, to patients. And could you just speak about that a little bit? Um, I, I know it must be overwhelming. You know, you're, you're doing your research, you're, you're a clinician, working with your patients, and to keep on top of every clinical trial. But again, I know that um, that's something you're very, very on top of. But could you give a little feedback about how you approach that? Yeah, I mean, it's, I'm, as an AML expert, I would still say I'm not really aware of every AML trial in the country. It's not possible. There's... Uh, there's two, three hundred, and they keep changing every week. So nobody really, um, you know, at a, at a clinician level is going to be completely aware. Now, what we do know is the broad areas, you know, the targeted groups, the particular mutational groups of trials, the immune uh, trials, uh, and of course, what's looking most exciting, whether it's in phase one, phase two, or phase three development. Uh, I, you know, completely echo the sentiments. Uh, I think 100% our effort should be to get patients on trial. And at MD Anderson, we have 180 trials in leukemia wow. uh, alone, uh, of which about 70 or 80 are in AML. And of course, this is uh, on the higher end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, but the focus is really to enroll people on trial. And I think what patients often, and I hear this almost every day in clinic, is that they're concerned because when you say a trial, uh, they are thinking experimentation. I think there's a big difference in experimentation and clinical investigation. So our effort is always to offer trials that give you standard of therapy plus something. And in fact, whenever we're treating a frontline patient, no leukemia expert, uh, you know, least of all in a very large academic center, is going to randomize a patient to something other than standard of care. But what we do want to see is, can we improve the standard of care? And that's how all these new drugs got approved. So we were doing these trials with FLT3 inhibitors added to chemotherapy for almost 10 or 11 years, uh, some of the large centers in the country, similarly with IDH inhibitors or gemtuzumab. And I have many patients who seven, eight, nine years ago were able to go on these trials many, many years before the FLT3 inhibitors were approved and get those benefits. So the way we like to put it is to try to get you tomorrow's therapy today. So you're going to get access approximately four to five years before a drug is approved. And almost always you will get the standard treatment plus uh, something. So you're not going to get less. You're going to get more. Now, of course, all of the uh, additions may not work, but the chance is that at least you'll get the benefit of standard agent plus something. And a lot of times when we explain that, then patients, of course, say, well, sure, I would like the trial, you know, rather than just standard of care. The other thing is with the cost, although it's true that, you know, the drugs may not all be free, at least you may get some or part, or in some cases, all the drugs uh, free. So at least there is some incentive there because a lot of times people say, well, insurance covers it, but the cost of a lot of drugs is astronomical. And even if you're paying just 5% for an average AML drug targeted therapy, which is somewhere between 15 to 20,000, 
you know, that 5% can be 1,000 to 1,500 a month. So a lot of times what I see for my patients is when they go on our trials, Flitri inhibitors, IDH inhibitors, and even the fact that they're not paying their copay often offsets their cost of coming to MD Anderson or coming to Dana-Farber or Sloan Kettering, whatever it may be. So I really think that one should definitely, you know, talk to uh, Leukemia Lymphoma Society, other major organizations, so that they can find out what trials are there. And many times patients say, well, I don't think there's a trial for me, or, or their local physician may not be aware. And I can guarantee you almost 99 to 100% of the times, there will be not just one, but many, many trials uh, that mm -hmm. are available to you. So I think that little bit of effort, emails, phone calls can go a long way. Can you talk about what questions uh, someone can ask their doctor in regards to clinical trials? What are those important questions? Absolutely. So, you know, there are so many of them. And, you know, one of the things that uh, my group of nurses and myself do is really, uh, you know, provide people with education about the basics of clinical trials and, and then the, the language and the questions they can use when they go back to their provider. Um, and then also when they go to make that connection with the clinical trial group. Um, so, you know, the list is long, I would say, um, you know, first and foremost, asking what the risks and benefits are. Uh, many times in a clinical trial, um, there are different requirements about how often someone might have to come to and from the site, um, what the finances might be um, related to that. Also, you know, a lot of studies or drugs used in studies have been used in other studies. So asking if there's any early results or any results from pri prior studies using those medications is important. Um, and, you know, asking about how this may affect quality of life, uh, you know, all those different kinds of questions. There's a very long list. Um, we do have a fabulous clinical trials booklet that um, patients can and caregivers can obtain that have lists of questions, um, and we always encourage people to read through that material as well. But wow. knowledge is power, so the more knowledge and research someone does um, and bringing someone with them to these appointments to really take notes because it can be so difficult to absorb all this information um, would be some of my recommendations. Wonderful, great feedback. So Steve, I'd like to circle back to you now. You know, you had this uh, overwhelming, uh, very uh, intense journey. Um, where did you get information about AML? Where did you get support? Um, we hear that so often when someone is diagnosed and they have to handle and make decisions fast. You know, what kind of resources did you utilize? And, and just, you know, tell our viewers out there so they can understand, um, you know, what to do and how to do it. Well, one thing I did not do is go on the internet and scare myself half to death. Um, I trusted my doctors. Uh, it did happen so quickly that I was in treatment before I even understood um, the nature of my disease. Mm -hmm. So um, for better or worse, I was getting on that train and going wherever it was going to take me. Uh, but I had a great team of social workers. I had great nurses. Wow. Uh, my oncologist was excellent in spending as much time with me as I wanted. And so it was a gradual kind of learning curve for me. Uh, and the fact that the early treatment went pretty well obviously helped uh, give me confidence. And uh, the same thing when I went down to the University of Minnesota Medical Center. Um, they gave me a very thorough explanation of what was going on, uh, recommended the stem cell transplant. Um, I had a colleague whose father actually worked in this area decades ago, and I talked with him. He stressed the importance of getting a second opinion. So I was able mm -hmm. to go to the Mayo Clinic, uh, which is a, about an hour and a half drive from where I live and talked first to a hematologist who said, um, I can tell you some things, but you should come back and talk to the transplant experts here. So I did that as well. So between my initial oncologist, my transplant oncologist, my second opinions at the Mayo Clinic, uh, I was pretty confident that, um, not that it would all work out, but that this was the best path to follow. And uh, as I followed that path, um, I did get invited to a, a clinical trial. And just from the patient's oh. perspective, you know, um, some years ago, I was the caregiver for my mother as she was struggling and eventually dying of breast cancer. And her oncologist wanted to put her in a clinical trial. And I was very suspicious. I'm wondering, is, is she not going to get the kind of care that she needs because you want to use her as a, as a subject in a, in a study? And I declined that study. Uh, and uh, some of the years later, I find myself being invited to join the study. And uh, I asked a lot of questions. Uh, especially when I saw that 22-page consent form, that's pretty daunting. There's a lot there, there's a lot to ask about, uh, and I did, and uh, people patiently answered my questions. 
And I just came to realize, essentially, in my case, that the trial wasn't even close to experimental. What they were saying is, we're, this is how we're going to treat you regardless. But if mm. you're willing to do a study, we're going to track the results, and that can help people down the line. So at that point, it, it seemed almost like a no-brainer. And uh, you know, I could have chosen my brother as a donor or a stem cell as a donor. Instead, I went into a study that randomized me, and it went into the stem cell, and it turned out just, just fine. But they said the five-year survival rates for either path are about the same. So that's why we're doing the study, to try and figure out what the different pathways are to that outcome uh, and when something will benefit patients in the future. So at that point, it just seemed like a reasonable thing to do. What helping people understand that you're going to get, you're going to get the best treatment they can give you regardless, even though you're in the study. I think that's, for many patients, I think that's the key point. And it sounds like Leah and her folks are working on that angle. That's really important for patients. Well, that is fabulous feedback. And, um, and, and if you could say, um, what I'm hearing you say is that you, you got a lot of support from, um, the, it sounds like from the uh, hospital where you received your care that there was, you mentioned a social worker and they sounded like they were really there to give you support. Would you, would you agree that everyone really worked together to uh, help you through this journey? Um, they did, uh, both the professionals and uh, a circle of friends and colleagues. And uh, of course, those email correspondence, as I said, I was getting multiple responses to every email I sent out from various people, sometimes mm -hmm. funny, sometimes, uh, sometimes dark humor, which I especially appreciate. Um, thank you, Dave, Milwaukee. Uh, so uh, a variety of things that came in, you know, people prayed for me. I'm not especially religious, but wh whatever they wanted to do was, you know, was, was fine with me. So the writing, again, was therapeutic. Um, I practiced a lot of mindfulness and meditation and yoga. I was a very active patient. I walked the halls five miles a day. Uh, when I couldn't leave my room, I was on the treadmill. Um, I just needed to do things that, that sort of kept my body up and moving. Uh, and that, um, I think that really helped my recovery. Um, I had nurses tell me at one point I was doing better than any other patient at that stage in treatment. Um, I'm not bragging about it, but I think, again, <laughs> initial good re reactions made it easy to get in this upward spiral. And I exercised, I ate as well as I could. I've seen patients have a bad time and they're kind of in a downward spiral. And it's really hard to reverse that. You know, if you can't, if you don't feel good enough to eat, if you don't feel good enough to exercise, um, it's really hard to get out of that, that box. And so anything um, you can do or anything nurses and social workers can do to help patients be proactive, um, be as active as possible, uh, ask lots of questions, and in whatever fashion suits their needs, try and tell your story, you know, whether it's caring bridge or emails or verbal recording of what's going on. I think there's a great therapy to just trying to put together from a patient's perspective what the hell's going on here and what's happening to me and how might it turn out. Um, and uh, those are some of the things that helped me get through. That, that is just great feedback. And um, Dr. Dover, um, you know, I'm picking up that Steve has just an amazing attitude. And uh, what kind of feedback do you give about that? These people are, you know, these patients, these wonderful people, their lives have been turned upside down. They're, you know, as you tell us, you know, it's just very quickly, they're living one life and now another. How much do you see, you know, listening to Steve's attitude and trying to be proactive and advocate for himself, um, do you feel that's an impact on overall success in um, treatment and moving forward? Yes, absolutely. I, I think that, you know, the attitude plays a major role. But I think, you know, a few things that Steve said are very important. One is that, you know, he did seek out uh, second opinions. Uh, he did go to Mayo Clinic, uh, a very large academic center. He got additional input. He learned about clinical trials and outcomes. And, you know, a lot of times uh, we have patients who may contact us or physicians uh, from outside who contact us or come to us. And sometimes we may not have um, you know, something different uh, to offer. There, there may be a standard treatment, but a lot of times the peace of mind of knowing uh, that you have, you know, consulted with a large academic center, one of the top centers, whether it's Mayo or MD Anderson or Sloan Kettering, whichever it may be, often helps a lot. Uh, and then there may be other times when we actually do say, uh, and this happens quite frequently, that, you know, actually we have a trial that I think will be a better FLT3 inhibitor or a better IDH inhibitor or a better antibody, and this is what I would do you know, if I was in your place or if I had a relative in your place. So I think that uh, helps your peace of mind and your, um, you know, mental framework. And the second thing is 
you know, and that's not something we can control is how you do to the initial treatment. You know, if you have good responses, uh, if you tolerate it well, then of course we do see that those patients are always more optimistic, have a better, you know, mental framework, it helps. But I also see that there are some patients who come in with a very negative uh, yeah. framework. And uh, that's where I think learning that there is so much new progress, that there are so many options, not only in the frontline setting, in the relapse setting, in the maintenance setting, even after post-transplant relapse, now we have things that potentially could cure patients, which we didn't have even five years ago. So I think knowing that there's a huge amount of progress, that the cure rates have doubled, tripled in some cases in elderly AML and FLT3 AML, uh, and that no longer having AML is the end of the world. You know, in fact, on our most recent data uh, update that we are going to publish soon, we see that in the young patients, 65 and below, the overall survival, if you take all patients who hit the door at MD Anderson, is about 66%. Wow. So only three patients actually had a long-term cure, and people are shocked when these even physicians I know of in the ICU and ER settings don't realize this fact. In the elderly AML, it's tougher, but we are going from 10% to almost 45, 50% cure rates in patients 65 plus. So I think once people hear these numbers, they completely change their mind and are much more optimistic. But getting that information across to patients, to caregivers, to make them do the referral or make them consider treatment, I think is the first big hurdle that we have to kind of overcome. Wow. And that, that is just very right, right on target. So I'd like to shift gears a little bit. Um, we do have a few questions we have time for. And Dr. Dover, um, the first question I'd like to get your feedback on, and forgive me with the pronunciation of the actual medication, I'll try my best. So this question comes in, what is the role of venetoclax, if any, in treating AML? And when might that be FDA approved, you know, from what you might know about this? Well, so the venetoclax is, is probably one of the most exciting drugs in AML, especially in elderly AML. In elderly mm -hmm. AML, it is the most exciting drug that we've had uh, probably forever. So we used to treat elderly AML, meaning above 65 years of age. And these are usually people uh, not just by age, but also based on the physician's review, considered not fit for intensive chemo. They may have kidney problem, liver disease, poor performance status, uh, immobility. And so we cannot give them the high chemo, the three plus seven that uh, Steve got. And we have to use low intensity therapy. And we used to use azacitidine alone uh, with a response rate of about 20 to 25% and a three-year survival of about 15 to 20%. And now we've done a study using azacitidine in combination with menetoclax where the response rates were 73%. So going from 25% to 73%, not doubling, really tripling. And the three-year survival is now 46, 48%. Uh, going from 15 to 18%. So that's a huge dramatic shift, three times response rate, three times of the potential cure rates. So I think right now we believe that azacitidine venetoclax really should be the standard of care for elderly AML if they're not going to get induction chemo. And in fact, it was FDA approved very recently. So two or three weeks ago, in fact, right before the ACT meeting, end of November, azacitidine in combination with venetoclax, as well as low-dose cytarabine in combination with venetoclax, were FDA approved. And I think now with the approval, although we were doing this even before the approval, uh, no elderly ML patient should uh, get azacitidine and low-dose cytarabine alone. I really think addition of venetoclax now is the standard of care, uh, triple response rate, triple survival. There's no reason not to do that. Wow, that, that is an amazing shift and such good news for our elderly patients. That is great. Um, I do have another question, and then I believe it's targeted for you as well, Dr. Dover. For those young uh, folks under 35 who relapse quickly within about 100 days after MUD allotransplant for AML M5, no mutation target, what will be a sustainable way to buy time and bridge for that next transplant? Um, could you talk a little bit about that? So that's a very tough scenario. If um, you know, a relapsing post-transplant itself is a very high-risk feature. It basically indicates the disease is aggressive uh, mm -hmm. and uh, may not respond to further chemotherapy or transplant. But relapsing early post-transplant, which we usually consider within 100 or 120 days, mm -hmm. is actually quite an adverse uh, feature. So for those patients, I think the best chance is if we can find a targetable mutation. So we will be looking for FLT3 uh, or IDH1, IDH2 mutations. If we find those, 
then I think then we do have some chance with either a FLT3 inhibitor alone or more likely in a FLT3 inhibitor in combination with low intensity therapy. And there's a number of these agents either approved, but I would actually go for a trial where we're combining either FLT3 inhibitors or IDH1, IDH2 inhibitors with other exciting agents like azacitine, minetoclax. I think that would be the best shot of getting a long-term remission, potentially a second transplant. Of course, there's a lot of caveats and variables and you have to look at an individual patient to make that determination. Uh, the other group uh, of therapies that you could use if we don't find a FLT3 or IDH, because only about 30 to 40% of patients will have one of these three mutations, is immunotherapies. And these can work really well, especially in the post-transplant relapse setting. And we have uh, drugs such as antibody drug conjugates. These are antibodies that carry a toxin and can uh, attack the leukemia cells or what we call immune checkpoint antibodies. These are also agents that activate your own immune system post-transplant to fight against tumor. And with these, we have seen some very exciting activity specifically in the post-transplant relapse. Uh, now, a lot of these are all under clinical trial setting because the antibodies and immune checkpoints are not yet approved. They may be in the next couple of years. So I think this would be an ideal scenario to find the academic center close to you and try to consider getting into one of the trials, either targeted therapy or immune therapy. And uh, another question would be, um, do you see post-transplant relapse more in specific mutations? Are those with specific uh, subtypes of AML? Yes, we do. So, so we see the post-transplant relapse more, most common in what we consider the adverse risk uh, AML. So mm -hmm. the adverse risk AML are the patients we definitely take to transplant, but unfortunately, even after transplant, they remain the group that have a high risk uh, of relapse. So these are patients who have what we call uh, TP53, one of the worst mutations. They will often have a high risk of relapse post-transplant or chromosome changes like deletion 7, deletion 5, deletion 17, also mm -hmm. another high risk group. And the third group is what we call secondary AML. So there are two ways you can get AML. You could have a spontaneous AML, yeah. most common, you know, we have a patient, no prior history of chemo, radiation, other cancers, comes in acute diagnosis of AML. But then there's another group making about 20 to 30% called secondary AML. So these are people who had prior breast cancer, colon cancer, bladder cancer, and got either chemotherapy or radiation for that, or people who had prior MDS, which is a AML precursor, and then develop AML. And these people who have secondary AML are much more risky and also more prone to relapse post-transplant. Uh, there are a few new drugs like Vixios that can work well in this situation. Uh, but in general, th these are probably the high-risk molecular or morphological groups that could relapse post-transplant. Very interesting. Well, I so appreciate um, all of the wonderful information and feedback that our guests have provided today. And it, the timing's great, you know, just coming off of ASH has been um, extremely encouraging. Uh, Dr. Dauber, with you sharing all these uh, wonderful new, you know, uh, eight new drugs and insight that's going on. And Leah, uh, your feedback has just been phenomenal. And really, I, I, I believe it's going to ease people's uh, concerns and fears about clinical trials. And uh, between you and Dr. Dauber speaking about the clinical trials, why they're so essential and they're doable. And uh, Steve, your feedback, um, not only about clinical trials, but your journey is phenomenal. And uh, I hope uh, our viewers look forward to seeing uh, information. Of, uh, you, we may not have mentioned this. Steve has written a book, soon to be published, about his journey. Uh, he has some very interesting feedback that we just didn't have enough time to share on today's webinar. So thank you again to our guests and our sponsors. And a replay will be completed soon, and you'll receive uh, it via your email. So our audience, please look forward to that. And remember, be your own advocate. Thank you.